Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Guillermo Amaral joins me. We're going to be talking about Taki. It's sort of like Google Hangouts, but it's all open source and all free, and it works really well. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E. FLY dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Guillermo Amaral. Episode 347 recorded July 29th, 2015. Taki. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code FLOSS in the billing section for a $10 credit. And by PagerDuty. PagerDuty decreases alerting noise for IT operations and developers to ensure that the right engineers are notified at the right time. Increase your uptime and sign up for a 14-day free trial at pagerduty.com slash twit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonenshot.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may have never heard of but might be using every day and not realizing it, projects you might not have ever heard of but now want to go download right after the show and go play with it. I know that happens to me a lot. Uh, I think I've already said it. I'm Randall Schwartz, so good. I think I'll, I'll just I'll continue from there. Let's go ahead and bring on our co-host, Guillermo. Welcome back to the show. Hi. Hi, Randall. Hi, hi. <laughs> I, I, I think I could have used another hour of sleep. I think that's part of what this is going to be about today. Plus the fact that it's like uh, it's on its way to 97 degrees here in Silicon. I'm going to call it sun forest instead of rainforest. We haven't had any rain in a while. so um, And it's going to be 101 tomorrow, but thank God I'm going to be on my way to London. So I'll be completely out of this. I'll be in sort of murky 60 degrees with rain uh, coming up real quickly. I'm so looking forward to that. Um, anyway, so I'm in Silicon Sun Forest and you're in your usual spot in Tijuana. That's it. Same place. Uh, extra humid, though, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, it's hopefully it'll get better. Let's see what happens. Okay, cool, cool. Well, it's not this week in weather. It's it's a Floss Weekly, so let's uh, talk about what today's project is. Today's project is actually sort of an array of products, but we're going to put them all under the Talkie.io umbrella. We're actually bringing back a guest that was first a guest on Floss Weekly back in, I had to look this up, December of 2008, Peter St. Andre was talking about XMPP back then, and some of what we're going to talk about today is sort of based on top of XMPP, so that it still has a relevance to what's going on here. We're also going to bring on our very own Bear, who I just found out is a, is a big uh, Twit uh, uh, infrastructure guy. So uh, he's going to come on also as, as well and talk about that. Um, so what do you know about Taki.io there, uh, Guillermo? Uh, nothing really. I'm, I'm not, I haven't seen the uh, project before, but um, I did check out the site uh, beforehand, before the show. And, you know, it, it does actually look interesting. Maybe, hopefully, it'll uh, be something we can use to replace uh, Skype on, on the show at some point. Well, I know we tried that with Jitsi, and we had some problems with that with the uh, one of the, um, I guess it's, they captured the video for this thing on Windows machines, and apparently it doesn't run very well there. So, uh, but maybe, maybe Taki AIO will be the uh, next thing for that. Maybe we'll finally get uh, away from Skype. Of course, now watch, now Skype's going to junk out because we, we're talking bad. Yeah, I know, yeah. We, <laughs> yeah I, I should never <laughs> jinx it that way until the show is over, but that's okay. Whether you're an experienced code warrior or just getting started, you need flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. DigitalOcean provides developers with droplets, which are virtual private servers that can be customized and deployed quickly to host websites, web apps, production apps, personal projects, virtual desktops, and almost anything else you can think of with full root access. I myself am a DigitalOcean customer. I found out about them back at uh, Scale, back uh, back in February, I think it was. And uh, I'm very happy with what the, the, the machine spun up like in 55 seconds. It was pretty amazing uh, because DigitalOcean is built for developers and is used by over 400,000 of them, including me. You can deploy and configure your droplets via a streamlined control panel or a simple API. You can choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, 
and FreeBSD. And that's what attracted me to DigitalOcean. They had just added the FreeBSD option. And, of course, that's my favorite uh, OS in the cloud. So really wonderful stuff. Servers can have up to 20 CPUs, 64 gigs of RAM, and 640 gigs of SSD hard drive space. And very highly scalable to meet the demands of a rapidly growing application or business. Full feature DNS management to easily manage your domains or use dedicated IPs. And it's so easy to get started. You can deploy an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. And I, I'm, I verified that. DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing. Servers start at only $5 per month. There's also an hourly pricing available starting at less than a penny an hour. But we're going to make it so you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code FLOSS for a free $10 credit. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. That's DigitalOcean.com. And once you sign up, Enter the code FLOSS in the billing section for a $10 credit. We thank DigitalOcean for their sponsorship of Floss Weekly. And now let's go ahead and bring on our guest. Let's start first with Peter. Peter, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Randall. It's good to be here. It's Very been cool. a while. Yeah, and where, where are you speaking to us from? I'm in Denver, Colorado. And I bet it's not heading for 97 degrees there, is it? Uh, it's not, no. We're about 6,000 feet above sea level here, so it doesn't ever get too hot. Yeah, yeah. I've been in Denver a few times. Uh, very, very cool place to uh, hang out at. Uh, and let's also go ahead and bring on Bear. Bear, welcome. Not welcome back. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks. Glad to be here. And where are you speaking to us from? The lovely city of Philadelphia, where it is humid and hot in that order. Man, I tell you, we should just stop doing shows in the summer. This is just this is nuts. Or at least get places that are air-conditioned to be able to do the shows from. But uh, why don't we start with Peter? Why don't you sort of give us the overview of what we're going to be talking about today? Sure, Randall. Um, you know, you were talking just now about Skype and uh, folks trying to develop open source alternatives to Skype. And in, in a large measure, that's where Talkie came from. Uh, we have we actually use some of the Jitsi components to put Talkie together. It's something that a lot of people are passionate about having more open alternatives to some of the big closed systems like Skype. And we can talk about some of the technologies that we're working on to try to get around some of the challenges. I think Jitsi, the Jitsi folks have uh, been working on some of the recording stuff as well. And uh, we actually use some of the Jabber XMPP technologies that uh, I talked with you about last time, low those many years ago. Hmm. Uh, so there, there are some connections, uh, some continuity with some of the projects that you're probably more familiar with over the years. So the, the closest thing that I could see to describe this as would be, uh, say, Google Hangouts, because you've got the ability to have multiple people on the screen. You've got, uh, you can do screen sharing, you can do chat. Uh, it, what, what does this have that Google Hangouts doesn't, uh, other than it being open source and we can do what we want to with it? Um, well, we have actually recently redeployed Talkie. So we re-architected it using the Jitsi Video Bridge for the media um, we can scale up to, we've tested <clears throat> typically about 15, 20 people. Um, Hangouts right now is limited to a lot. They tend to limit it to about 10. Um, that's not a huge differentiator for most folks, simply because how many people really need to have a team meeting with 20 people in the conference, right? Most people use Hangouts or Talkie for smaller sessions. Um, I think what is... One thing that differentiates something like Talkie or Jitsi Meet from Hangouts is that it's very it's easier to use, right? You're not integrated with the whole account management system like you are in Skype or Google Hangouts where you have to add someone, are they in my circles? All that kind of stuff can be kind of confusing to folks. Whereas something like Talkie or Jitsi Meet, you just go to this URL and there you are in the conference. So it's a, in, in that sense, I think it's a lot easier for people to use and they like the user-friendly aspect of it. So this is a hosted solution. Would I ever want to download this and run it on my own server? Well, we, we have been working on that. We built it originally as the hosted service. So Tonky right now is deployed in the cloud and we do have versions of it that some customers of ours, ours being and yet, which um, is the folks who have built Talkie, 
we do have an on-premise version. All of the components are open source. So we use an XMPP server called Prosody. We use the Jitsi video bridge. We use a turn server and I can get into how all that stuff kind of works together. Mm -hmm. uh, we use a turn server we'll called Reese Dundee. It's um, one. It's peer to peer for one on one sessions. It only uses the video bridge when you get above one to one. And how do you scale something like that if you use the uh, the hosted version? Well, sc scaling is it's a classic scaling for audio video. Um, you need to have everybody using talking to the same server um, because it's video. The bridge requires that, so we monitor the number of connections that are available and just add on new servers for the video bridge. The scaling for the Prosody and the Stun server, they have a higher threshold for their user count. So uh, th typically it's there's more video bridges than there are Prosody or um, Stun server bridges, Stun turn servers. So we just monitor them and, and when the threshold exceeds 70%, we just add on another server. And uh, is this hosted at like at EC2 or some other sort of uh, service? Oh. We tried, we tried putting the video bridge on virtual servers early on, and when you start getting into thousands of people using the video bridge, the, the virtual servers all start having a network lag that, that causes problems, causes audio glitches, causes uh, latency. So we, the video bridge is now on, it's, everything right now is hosted on Rackspace because Rackspace has a blend of on-metal servers is what they call it, and also virtual servers. So that all that is still in inside of our um, internal subnet for the product, and but we can mix virtual with bare metal servers. We actually have a chat question from the chat room already. Gray five eighty says, uh, "With Jitsi, I found that setting up the server component to be a huge pain in the backside. How does the setup for uh, this stuff compare?" Oh, it's still a huge pain in the backside. It took us <laughs> months. <laughs> it took us months to tune the Java uh, parameters to get everything working correctly. Um, and we also have the prosody component, which is what uh, Jitsi communicates with in order to coordinate what room people are associated with. Uh, that has its own parameters. And then you have the stun turn server, um, which required its own bit of, um, well, that's a, so that's a secret sauce. That's what makes this a product is that we've gone through and learned by having Talkie as a public available service, what works and what doesn't work. So you kind of have your own test load because everybody gets to use it uh, for their benefit, but now you're getting to benefit from knowing how to scale this. Exactly. And that's a classic case of any freemium or, or public hosted site. We have thousands of users every day using it, so we can look at the logs and the metrics, and we can look at the complaints that come in through the feedback channel. And we also use it ourselves, so we're dogfooding it um, and learn from that. And it's been running for two two plus years, so we've got a lot of lot of learning from that. So how did this get started? What, what did you, what, what, what problem are you trying to solve when you said, I'm going to create something from scratch about how to do this? Either of you. No, I'll let Peter answer that. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, Peter. I guess. Oh, Alternatives well. to something like Skype. You were muted there for a bit, Peter. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, the the original um, the original intent of use of Talkie was uh, one of our developers, Henrik, was exploring the new WebRTC technologies that was that became available in Chrome, and he was looking for a way to to have a demo product that would show off um, his our skills in in manipulating WebRTC. So he created Talkie as a demo for that, um, and that's that was the initial version of it. And then we realized how cool it was and spun the product up around that. But I think Peter may have a more marketing-oriented answer. <laughs> well, I, what I was going to say there is that, you know, there's always been the dream of having open source alternatives to things like Skype. Um, so I think we are, at, and yet yeah, we're very heavily involved in open source. Um, you know, folks like Bear and I have been involved with Jabber for many, many years. Um, we do a lot, all we license all the code that we possibly can, MIT, um, and provide, we have, we're a con, more of a consulting and custom app development shop. So having open source code that then we can build on to do things for customers works out great because they want to be adding something like voice and video to an online learning app or a telemedicine app or something like that. 
we then have the knowledge to hand off to them so that they can run it themselves if they want. And we can quickly build products for people who want to have new kinds of functionality. So that's kind of our model. Um, we don't really... Uh, I'm you know, trying to. I, um, can you invite me? So, uh, but yeah, I mean, the WebRTC sort of makes all this possible. And, you know, maybe it would be helpful for folks to describe a little bit more what that does and how that works. Yeah, I'm actually interested. I've seen the term go by a few times, and actually we've mentioned it a couple of times in previous shows, but uh, you sound you're like you're, you're more of an expert on it than anybody so far. So why don't you, why don't you give us a, yeah, what, 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 what is it doing for us to make that work? So traditionally, Randall, um, we, in order to build these sorts of applications, it was pretty hard, right? I mean, if you go back to the early days of telephony, well, of course, it was kind of a closed system and it was all run by the telcos. Eventually, we got things like SIP, Asterisk, technologies like that, where it became a little bit easier to build applications, but it was still too hard. Your average developer didn't understand how to do things like the APIs for getting access to the microphone and the camera and the speakers on a device. So what WebRTC has done, and this, was, this is a technology that has been developed through the Internet Engineering Task Force and the W3C jointly, is to have a programmatic API and protocols so that your device can get access to the mic and the camera and the speakers and so that you can build applications that do voice, video, and screen sharing. Um, those have traditionally been difficult things to do for most developers, or maybe you used Flash in, in the olden days for some sort of applications like that. But if you wanted to build something like Skype or WebEx or a technology like that, you had to do a lot of hoops and you had to build a downloadable application that people had to use. The nice thing about WebRTC is that now you can just, if your browser supports it, which not all of them do yet, um, you can just go to a URL and voila, if you give permissions to that application, you can now be in a video chat like uh, Hangouts or Skype. And that's pretty powerful because now we develop, developers are starting to have the ability to build interesting applications and bring the principles that we're accustomed to from Unix and the open web to voice and video, which traditionally we haven't had. So I think we're going to see, and we already are seeing, a lot of innovation in this space so that more people are building applications on their own instead of having to depend on the telcos or someone like that. So we're seeing telemedicine and, and, and online learning. A lot of applications are starting to get built now um, that couldn't have been built before. And it's pretty exciting to see some of the innovation that's starting to happen. It's still kind of hard, like Bear was describing, and we can talk more about the hard bits and uh, how, how we see some of that being overcome over time. But it's pretty exciting to see developers actually being able to start to build applications that they couldn't build before. One of the things that I, make, I find the most interesting about Skype is that it uh, auto scales up and down as your bandwidth changes. Does uh, WebRTC have the, have the ability to do that? Yeah, that's built into the uh, WebRTC APIs. There's some trickery that has to happen, obviously, to kind of uh, adjust to your bandwidth and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's part of the... the so Google has built an open source library called... If you go to webrtc.org, you can download that and start playing with that. That has support for all those things. Most people who build these applications use the Google... Uh, ver implementation of the API. There's also one that Ericsson has built called OpenWebRTC, and there might be some other ones that people are building as well. But those are the two primary ones that most folks use. And what is the uh, the uh, support for WebRTC on on Mac and on Windows right now? Yeah, that's a good uh, good question, Guillermo. Um, it's still sort of an experimental technology. So there's support for it in Chrome and Chromium based technology, so you, know, you use it in Opera or on, on Android. Um, there's support for it in Mozilla, Firefox. So fo Firefox, for instance, the Mozilla folks have a service called Hello that you can do browser-to-browser -browser calls with other uh, Mozilla users, but it also interoperates with things like Jitsi Meet and Talkie. Um, Microsoft is adding support for kind of a flavor of WebRTC called ORTC, and we can get into some of what the differences are there. 
Uh, on the Mac, there's no native support yet, and it's unclear what what Apple's intentions are because it's always unclear what Apple's intentions are. Um, what we've done and what most people do is obviously there's a big push to mobile. So we have a, an iOS app for Talky, whereas on Android, if you have a pretty modern device, it'll mostly work for people just using the Chromium browser. Um, but for Android, for iOS rather, people have to build native apps, which is unfortunate because there isn't native support for WebRTC and Safari. Uh, how how about uh, behind a VPN? I, I noticed somebody in the uh, chat, uh, Yogi, uh, mentioned that a, uh, WebRTC doesn't work that well with VPNs. So there are, it's not like the web, right? Where you just go to a website and things mostly work. Um, if you want to send media, it becomes difficult because you have NATs and firewalls in the way and you, you might be on VPNs and stuff like that. So there's various tricks that you need to do in order to make things go. Bear mentioned that in theory, WebRTC for, to send the audio and video is peer-to-peer. -peer. And that sounds great, right? Everyone likes peer-to-peer -peer technologies. In practice, you don't always have a public IP address. So how do you make this work? Well, this is where the stun and turn come in. So these are IETF technologies that were developed in various RFCs, you know, defined in various RFCs, and there's various implementations of them. What you, what you have to do is basically find a way to get out of your NAT or VPN or firewall context. And you can do that in several ways. You can poke a stun server and basically figure out what your public-facing IP address is on the outside of your NAT. You can also... In some situations, we have to use TURN, which is the actual media relay, because you can't find a peer-to-peer, -peer, a direct connection from one device to another. And that's where TURN comes in. So TURN acts as a media relay. It doesn't decrypt the media. You still encrypt the media end-to-end. -end. It just happens to go through a different media path. And we have to run that on the standard port, which is 3478 or something like that. I can never remember. Um, but then we also need to do some tricks in order to make it work with certain kinds of firewalls. So we also run it on port 80 and port 443 in order to get through. And w once you do all the right tricks for your stun and turn servers, things will work um, because you can find public IP, IP addresses and use a relay if you need to. Is there a helper app? to uh, help you sort all these uh, new settings out? Um, no, it just works because, the, well, either if you use something like an I, uh, you know, our Talky iOS app or if you're going to our website or you download the JavaScript or if you do something like Jitsi Meet, you're downloading the JavaScript from there as well. And it's got all, you don't have to, you know, in the old days with the SIP client, you had to do all this configuration, right? Well, what's your proxy and what's your uh, stun server that you're going to use and all that stuff. These days people don't want to go through all those hoops because it was very difficult for real users to figure out how to use something like a SIP client, uh, which is actually where Jitsi started. It used to be called SIP Communicator. Um, nowadays, that sort of all happens automatically by talking to the service that you're trying to use. Um, there's interesting aspects of that kind of uh, in terms of federation and so on, but a lot of folks just use a particular service, actually getting those to federate and talk to each other is another story. Uh, do you know if this technology is going to replace SIP at some point? Well, Guillermo, I think, um, you know, SIP is used in a lot of enterprise settings for voice over IP and stuff like that. Where I see things going is that we will have more and more apps that you use instead of having these more standardized applications or clients. So where things are going, I see is that let's say you want to talk to your insurance company. They have an app for if you get in a car accident and you can have it on your Android device, you can have it on your iPhone and so on, and your tablet and so on and so forth. Well, now instead of using the public switch telephone network or using uh, your voice phone that's connected on your desk, which who has any of those anymore, you might have a specialized app to talk to your insurance agent in order or your insurance company. And maybe you pick up your 
tablet and say, okay, well, here's the dent in the fender and, you know, here, you can send still video or you can send live video and you can get stuff done that way. Similar to maybe talk to someone, uh, your doctor or talk to, they can patch someone in who's a specialist and things like that at, at a hospital. I think we're, we are seeing already more specialized apps, just like we have specialized apps on the web and they're called websites. And if you want to get something done, you go to a particular website you don't have like this general thing called the internet that you then, you know, you, they all use the standard technologies, but you have a more particular application in order to get a problem solved that you're trying to figure out. And I think that's the direction that we're going to see more for voice and video. So I might go to my insurance company website and they might have WebRTC there. And then I can just talk with someone live instead of using the phone. We'll have specialized applications for a lot of things. So that's not going to make SIP go away. I think people still do sometimes use SIP for the signaling for WebRTC. So WebRTC defines the camera and mic access, and it defines the parameters that you need to do to set up that peer-to-peer -peer connection with another device. But it doesn't actually define the messaging or the, the signaling, as it's called, to get those messages from one side to the other that figures out, that does all the negotiation. So for Talky, we use XMPP for that, the Jabber XMPP technologies. Um, some people use SIP, some people, most people kind of roll their own and do just some JavaScript over WebSocket and things like that. But I don't think SIP is necessarily going to go away. Nothing, you know, older technologies don't tend to totally go away, but I think it's not as easy for people to use and extend and build these sorts of applications. So it's seen less use than it used to for things like voice over IP. That's a long-winded answer, sorry. <laughs> no, no, don't worry. We love long-winded answers here on the show. Uh, <laughs> may, 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 maybe we can uh, take a little uh, step back and uh, you can mention the uh, differences between WebRTC and ORTC. Yeah. So WebRTC started, this kind of gets into um, internet protocol jargon. Uh, there's a technology called session description protocol, which is a textual Def definition of the session that you have with someone. So let's say it talks about what your codecs are. Do you want audio only? Do you want audio and video? For your codecs, what parameters do you have? So let's say you're using Speaks or you're using Opus. Well, what's your um, sample rate? For video, what's the frame size um, and, and the, the frames per second? Those sorts of things. They all need to be negotiated. And there's a technology that was defined in the IETF years ago called Session Description Protocol, or SDP. And SDP is not the prettiest protocol in the world. And especially for like web developers, they don't want to see this primitive old technology <laughs> called SDP. Um, so the way that WebRTC 1.0 is defined is that it is it uses SDP as the control surface back and forth uh, between the devices to define the sessions. Um, it's not the most developer friendly thing that you've ever seen. Um, so some folks decided that, hey, it would be nice to have a more object oriented approach. And the O in ORTC stands for object. It's object RTC. Um, it's actually very similar to what we did in Jingle in the Jabber XMPP community. So other than the fact that Jingle has angle brackets and some people don't like those anymore. So we have JSON representations of that. Um, but it's, Jingle was more of an object oriented approach. Okay, here's what your transport product protocols or transport options are. Um, here's what the IP addresses we could use. Here's a relay server, all those sorts of things. And then here's a description of the media that I want to send. Maybe it's audio, maybe it's video, maybe it's both. Um, in Jingle, which we defined in the Jabber community with Google, and that's what was used in Google Talk back in 2005, um, we had a more object-oriented approach. And people wanted to do something like that for WebRTC, but they didn't particularly want to use Jingle for whatever reason. And so they've defined a more object-oriented approach. And that's the technology that we understand and has been communicated from Microsoft is that's what's going to be supported in their upcoming uh, Edge browser, which we at And Yet are very excited about. And uh, we see that being also kind of like WebRTC 1.1, if you will. Um, that technology is something that will be 
probably supported in Chrome and, and Mozilla over time, and who knows, maybe eventually Apple. Uh, it's easier to build stuff with. SDP is, is hard to understand. Uh, it's quicker. We were doing some experiments just last week with our with some supporting ORTC. It was very easy to get running. Now, for a lot of web developers and 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 user oriented developers, they're not going to really have to know or care because their library is going to obscure all those details from them, and they're just going to have a connect to someone else or start session method or whatever, and they're not going to necessarily care about what happens under the hood. But I think ORTC will enable people to more quickly build these sorts of applications because they won't have to munge through the SDP, which is not a fun thing to have to do. Okay. Well, so uh, we have a question from the uh, chat. I think it's from uh, JPR. Uh, he wanted to know what streaming uh, video format you guys are using. Um, well, yes, there's the great internet uh, video codec battle that occurred at mm -hmm. the IETF over the last few years. We use VP8. That's what is supported in Chrome, and it's also supported in Firefox. Um, there was a huge debate at the IETF about the video codecs. Uh, Mozilla also supports H.264. Um, we understand that probably um, IE or Edge, rather, will be supporting H.264. There's a lot of H.264 out there. Um, both of both H.264 and VP8 are mandatory to implement in the WebRTC specifications produced by the IETF. So we're going to probably see both of those in all the browsers eventually. But given that a lot of the innovation was coming from Google originally, they were supporting VP8 and uh, they are working on the H.264 support. But uh, obviously H.264 um, has a different sort of patent story than uh, VP8. And there's also work going on at the IETF, by the way, um, just to back up a second. Several years ago, or a number of years ago now, I was involved with work at the IETF uh, to get the Opus codec started. So for, op for video, for audio rather, sorry, um, most people use Opus, which is a very open codec produced through the IETF. Um, and there's an effort now to produce a similarly open and patent-free or unencumbered codec for video at the ITF that's gotten started recently. So hopefully over time we'll see more open and less patent-encumbered codecs for video as we have also done for audio. And uh, what about the uh, container format? What, what are you guys using for that? When you say the container format, Guillermo, what do you have in mind? Uh, let's say you have like um, ABI, you know, uh, something that wraps both the audio and the video, or are they going separate? Uh, yeah, those, well, for streaming technologies, everything gets sent over RTP, real-time transport protocol. So there isn't a, a packaging format like there is when you, def when you record something. It just goes real-time over RTP, and that is typically encrypted with the, with something called DTLS, which is a datagram version of transport layer security, which some people know as SSL. Um, so there isn't the packaging. I mean, there's there's a packetization format that you have to do for um, for RTP, but there isn't a packaging format like you have for recorded audio and video. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't completely sure if that, that uh, got sent as, uh, let's say, packetized or, or maybe as a, a something wrapped inside like an uh, an um, Borbis container of some sort, right? Uh, okay, so let's say uh, sorry, I just lost the uh, my train of thought, my uh, train of thought here. Uh, may, maybe we can uh, actually go into uh, how could somebody you know like me if I want to try this at home? Uh, do you guys have have any uh, a virtual private servers? I I, I can. Uh, I mean, like a, a virtual image I can install in some machine here? Yeah, um, we haven't gotten to that point yet. We've been doing a lot of work. We just actually relaunched uh, Talkie using the more modern approach that Bear was describing with the video bridge and so on so that we could have larger conferences. Uh, we haven't done those sorts of packagings yet. Uh, we have some dockerization that we've done, and, and Bear can talk a little bit more about what we've done there. Part of the challenge with these sorts of technologies is that they're very unfamiliar to most people. 
Um, most people, yeah, maybe they've run a Jabber server even. And, uh, but your typical folks who know about web development, they don't understand about turn servers and video bridges and all this kind of stuff. It's kind of a arcane science and, and there's a lot of work like Randall was describing, um, you know, to get the things like the Jitsi video bridge up and running. It's taken a lot of time to figure all that stuff out. And that's kind of been our priority to get all that containerized and, and figure out how to run it. Um, we haven't put together all the ops glue and the packaging to have easy to install versions. Although we have open sourced all the underlying components that we use to make it go. So we use the Prosody and Restundi and, and the Jitsi Video Bridge, but then we've also open sourced the various components that we use for, for signaling, as well as all the web, um, the web code for JavaScript. So we use something called stanza.io which is a JavaScript friendly XMPP library and another one called jingle.js, which handles the signaling stuff. So if you go to otalk.org, there's a link to um, the uh, GitHub repos that we have for otalk and we have an otalk.org there uh, that has all the co open source code, but packaging it all up yet hasn't been top of mind for us because we're a, trying to get the service running and figure these things out. And B, we've got customers who pay us to actually do projects for them. So this is all of the stuff that we do here is a little bit kind of uh, side stuff that we try to open source as much as we can, but we haven't always necessarily gotten it all done yet. But Bear, so maybe you want to talk, talk a little bit more about how some of the things work from the ops side. The... the um because the majority of the, the items we use are off-the-shelf open source projects, you can virtualize them easily. Prosody runs perfectly fine in a container, and there's even a Docker image for Prosody on the Docker registry site. The same thing uh, for Restundi. It's a C program, so you can throw that into a container. Um, the, the video bridge is a little cumbersome only because it's a Java stack, but if you're familiar with Java, running it in a container is also not, the issue, not a problem. The, the problem comes from getting those all to talk to each other across an internal network with the appropriate ports open and security because you have to have both UDP and TCP uh, IP table rules set up. And then getting them to talk to each other in, a, in an efficient manner because you are dealing with audio and video. So you not only have the internal communication, you have to coordinate. You also have to make sure that your communication to the web browser clients are um, clear and, and unencumbered in order to get a quality product. And that's where, that's the biggest reason why we haven't put out there a prepackaged bundle is that when people install these bundles, the expectation of it working perfectly in a virtualized environment is high. And when it doesn't, it looks bad. So until we can figure out exactly what type of orchestration tool to use to install it on somebody else's location, we're avoiding that completely right now and focusing on other issues for for the ops side of the house. Hey, so what's uh, what's the relationship between OTOC and Taki? We, we have a lot of different terms on the table here. And I'm trying to figure out, how, excuse me, how this all fits together. Can you uh, address that? Sure, Randall. I mean, we Taki.io is the service that we run as a free thing. It's mostly a showcase for us to, as Bear said, learn a lot about how these technologies work. And we use it ourselves and people also use it just to talk to, with their friends or their coworkers and things like that. We have bundled, not bundled, you know, but we've uh, put together all of the code that we're using under this OTALK umbrella. And so if you go to our otalk.org site, which needs a lot of work, we're working on some of the documentation for that right now, or the OTALK org that we have on GitHub, that's kind of the rubric under which we've collected all of the code that we've worked on. So there's a lot of the front end code and also the back end code to make these different components talk to each other well. And there's some um, messaging that we have to do in order to get diagnostics and metrics and stuff like that. And so all of the, all of the code has been put under this OTOC rubric, which 
we kind of wanted to keep that separate from Talky itself because other people want to contribute and have contributed to some of the code that we have there out there at Otalk and have used that in various products. Um, actually, the, I don't know if you've ever looked at Kaiwa, which is a um, – it's kind of like an open source Slack clone. Uh, they used a bunch of our Otalk code and they didn't – you know, maybe it's not so good to have it associated with something like Talky, which, you know, it's kind of a – it's a nice – uh, you know, friendly URL, but we tried to have a more kind of serious tone to some of the open source code that we've been building. That leads well into my next question, which is, uh, do you imagine OTOC to be the project that provides the glue and uses all these upstream codes? And if so, are you also contributing back to those upstream uh, codes? Yeah, that's a, you know, we, so we have contributed back uh, to Chrome, which is the, and the WebRTC project. One of our team members, Philip Honka, is a big contributor there. Um, we contribute things back to Prosody. We've built some Prosody modules. Prosody is an XMPP server that's very componentized and modularized. We have built uh, some components that add on to Prosody to do the call control, if you will. So when you, we actually use XMPP chat rooms as the signaling point, and then different people who join this multi-user hangout, if you will, um, they basically join a chat room and then they get these jingle invites to do the media. So we've open sourced these various components. We've contributed patches back to uh, the Restund project as well. Uh, to fix some bugs there. So we definitely are contributing back and also building some independent code like stanza.io and jingle.js and some of the stuff on the iOS side as well to try to make it easier for people to build these sorts of applications. It's still not easy because there's a lot of moving parts and it's hard to get it all to work together. Um, we're still trying to kind of figure out uh, how, like Bear described how to make that easier for folks. And until we do, you'd have these failures like you have trying to set up Jitsi and do the recording and it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of fail, falls over and we don't really want people to have that kind of experience. And uh, if, do I, if I understand this correctly, maybe you said this already and maybe I, I read it somewhere that one of the differences between this and say Google Hangouts is that you're only sending one stream to the central Jitsi video bridge, whereas Google Hangouts, you kind of have to be connected to everybody else. I am, no, be, not quite. So the way that Bear described it is, is accurate. When you have like a one-to-one -one or even a two-to-one session, you can go peer-to-peer. -peer. But the challenge is it's not like, um, let's say, text messaging. If you wanted to use something like uh, OTR and encrypt your messaging to a bunch of people, you could do that in a multi-user context because how hard it is, is it to encrypt a message? Um, it's a t small thing. It's a textual thing. It doesn't take a lot of resources for your computer to encode that, if you will, or encrypt that. Now, what happens with audio and especially video is the, the formats are so much heavier and so much larger that your device simply cannot encode all the video streams that you would need to do peer to peer. So if I, let's say we have 10 people on a conference, my computer now has to encode 10 video streams, one for each person that I'm sending to. That full mesh model simply doesn't scale for video. So we need a helper application in the middle, and that's what the role that the Jitsi video bridge plays. It's something could we call a selective forwarding unit. So I send my video, typically both high res and low res, but depending on bandwidth, perhaps only low res, I send that to the SFU, which is the Jitsi video bridge in this case, and it fans that out to everyone in the conference. And Google uses a similar one. I think they have one that they either built themselves or from a company called Video, V-I-D-Y-O. Um, you need to have that in the mix in order to scale up beyond even three or four people at a time because your computer simply just can't encode and encrypt that much outbound video. So speaking of encryption, it sounds like... Um like you guys even watching the servers that my video is going through, you wouldn't be able, you'd be able to tell who I was connecting to, at least the IP address is who I'm connecting to, but you wouldn't be able to get any of the content, any of the chat or any of the video, uh, intercept that? Well, we would like to think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> and okay. that's the place that we would like to get to. Um, when we do one-to-one, -one, that's all encrypted because you, your browser or iOS device or tablet or whatever, 
can set up an encryption context with the other party and that gets encrypted end to end using something called DTLS, which as I said, is like a UDP version of SSL. Um, so DTLS SRTP is what is used typically to encrypt the media end to end. There's also ZRTP from, from, and people can use that as well. Uh, we use DTLS SRTP, which is a standard. Now the problem is in order for this selective forwarding unit that I was talking about to do its job, it needs to decrypt the video and the audio in the middle so that it can then send that off to the other people in, in the conference. And unfortunately, given the constraints of current technologies, it has to act, act as an encryption endpoint in order to do its job. There's work that's starting at the Internet Engineering Task Force in a, a working group called the PERC Working Group, P-E-R-C, uh, to do what they call privacy enhanced RTP conferences, which is what PERC stands for. And that is, they're trying to start to figure out how can we encrypt the media end to end and still have something in the middle that helps out to do for the scalability. Because given the constraints of, of devices today, maybe quantum computers can solve this problem, but given the constraints of devices today, we simply cannot scale up end-to-end -end encrypted video with more than three or four people in a conference. So if you wanted to have something on a hangout scale or a talkie scale of 15, 20 people, it's just simply impossible to do. There's work that's starting to try to figure out that problem, but it's gonna take a few years, I would say at least, to try to get the, the solutions figured out in the standard side and then deployed and implemented on, on the software side. Well, I understand Guillermo has a couple more interesting questions, but I have a very important message before we get to Guillermo's <laughs> questions. Uh, PagerDuty is an operations performance platform that delivers visibility and actionable intelligence to help increase the uptime of your apps, servers, websites, and databases. If you rely on your server and services to always be up, PagerDuty is an essential tool. As the hub of your operations, PagerDuty connects all of your systems into a single view where you can see critical events across all of your monitoring tools. There are over 100 ready-to-use integrations, including Nagios, New Relic, Keynote, App Dynamics, or you can roll your own with PagerDuty's API. You can also decrease the noise. Incidents are automatically filtered and deduplicated to ensure only actionable alerts are at delivered. PagerDuty's analytics tool will also identify common problems, allowing you to proactively make system improvements and prevent future outages. You can also customize how to fit it uh, to how you and your team work, regardless of location and size. PagerDuty is trusted by thousands of companies, including Microsoft, GitHub, Boeing, Nike, Pinterest, and Box and also the companies that I have as clients as well. So very, very uh, useful. You get the right engineer on the right problem at the right time. Visit pageduty.com slash twit to sign up for a free 14-day trial. And for as little as $19 a month, you can increase your uptime with PagerDuty. And when you sign up for a new account, you also get a free T-shirt. That's pageduty.com slash twit. And we thank PagerDuty for their support of shows like Floss Weekly. And so Guillermo, you had a couple more questions to ask? Uh, yeah, I, and somebody in the chat room, uh, Java Man, I think, wants to know if they, you can uh, transfer files using this system. Yeah, we have file transfer working. We don't, haven't actually um, deployed it on Talkie yet. Uh, part of why we use Jabber for the messaging was that the jingle work that we've done in, in the Jabber community over all these years has support for all those sorts of things. Um, so file transfer we have working, we haven't put it in the UX yet. Um, uh, some people also, I should mention that there's another aspect of WebRTC, which is called the data channel. So WebRTC gives you this voice and video channels, um, but it also has something called the data channel, which enables you to, if you don't have a robust signaling method, which we happen to have with using XMPP, you have this kind of back channel that you can use for pretty much anything. And a lot of people use the data channel for file transfer. Okay, makes sense. Uh, so you also mentioned uh, XMPP, right? Uh, is there a fee? Uh, may, uh, maybe this has been cleared up before, but I'm not really, uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, can you also do uh, text chat to maybe send, uh, you know, file links or uh, URLs to, uh, you know, your other companions? Sure, Guillermo. Well, you know, Jabber started as an instant messaging system, and we renamed it XMPP when we standardized it at the IETF back in 2002, 2003 or so. But um, it has obviously all that text chat stuff built in from the get-go. We actually use 
an XMPP, a Jabber XMPP chat room as the signaling point for talkie. Um, so we basically just get text chat for free by doing it that way. Some people who build their own signaling methods and messaging methods for WebRTC don't have that kind of signaling context. So they might use something like the data channel for text chat as well. I'm guessing it wouldn't be uh, you know super easy to, let's say, switch my Jabber. I have an in-home Jabber server here. Uh, change that over, maybe amplify it or make it better to like support Taki. Uh, in this case, if I want to, you know, talk to somebody downstairs, or maybe connect my outside, uh, uh, my outside a camera, and talk to somebody who's, uh, you know, ringing the doorbell. Yeah, that's a classic use case, of course. Um, so we use a server called Prosity, which we're fans of, um, an XMPP server called Prosity, and the the signaling stuff that we've done is a Prosity module called ModMuck Focus, which basically turns your multi-user chat room, which is muck into a conference focus, which is your signaling context for figuring out how you're going to talk to other people and set up your voice and video. Um, so using Prosody, you're a little bit farther along. Now, some we what we've what I have failed to do is define a little bit more what the protocol is that we're using for these multi-user chat rooms to make them um, a little bit more multimedia focused. Um, so those ones, you know, if you're using OpenFire or you're using eJabberD or some other server, there's some work that still needs to be done to kind of get other XMPP servers supporting the same underlying methods. And that's something that we need to do a better work of standardizing some of the ex little extensions that we've done. But it's pretty straightforward. You're just combining multi-user chat and jingle and you're mostly there. Um, so there's some work that we need to do on a standardization side through xmvp.org. And then there's also some work that those servers would do. Like, let's say you're using eJabberD. Well, how does it talk to the Jitsi video bridge? We had an XMPP extension for that, too, called Colibri. But um, it's, it's not as widely supported yet as it could be. It takes a long time, unfortunately, to build these sorts of technologies in an open way as opposed to doing something like Skype or Slack or something like that where you, you're you not trying to coordinate among a lot of different parties. Um, but we're getting there. We're getting there. And I think over the next few years, we're really going to try to make this more of a standardized thing so that if you are running a different XMPP server or a different Jabber server, you could integrate with something like the Jitsi Video Bridge or maybe Free Switch or something like that. Um, there's a lot of work that we need to do to coordinate among these different projects to make this all go. And so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what's on the roadmap? Where, where is this headed eventually? Well, Randall, I think one of the things that we need to do is just what I was talking about, getting some of the extensions that we've done standardized and getting more support for it in more, um, more, more Jabber servers and also some of the client side stuff. So we have work that we've done with stanza.io and jingle.js to open source some of this stuff, but it sure would be nice to have more of that supported in Android and iOS and Linux and so on. So there's some work that needs to happen there. Um, we need to do what Bear was talking about, which is actually doc betting, providing better documentation and also better packaging so that some of this stuff is easier to run. Right now, all of this stuff is pretty hard to figure out. And, you know, it'd be nice if there was just some Node.js project that someone did that made it all super easy. But unfortunately, the problems are pretty hard to solve. And so folks like the Jitsi team, which was recently acquired by Atlassian, um, you know, they have a lot of knowledge about RTP and RTCP, which is the control channel for these RTP streams and so on. It's kind of, uh, you know, black magic to a lot of people how all this stuff works. So we need to get, try to simplify that, but it's not always so easy to try to, to do that because there, there are hard problems involved. And then the other one I think is the end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, we would really love to not have access to any of your video because I don't want to know what your audio and video is for many reasons. Um, but right now, given this current state of technology, it's just too hard. So having some progress on that front is another thing that we're very interested in. And we do actively contribute to the standards groups at the W3C and, and the IETF to try to get some of this stuff defined and, and improved. And then there's the other one that Guillermo mentioned, which is, let's say, support in uh, Windows and support in, in Apple OSs. And that's something that, 
I think is going to take a few more years to really get widespread deployment, especially on the Apple side. We just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, they've put so much investment into FaceTime. Why would they necessarily try to do this in a more open fashion and redefine that whole service, which is successful for them and it works? So I'm not sure what's going to happen there. But um, it, it's sort of still an experimental technology, all the WebRTC stuff that we talked about, and it's getting there and it's going to be a success over the years, I think, and we're going to have to see more applications using it and it's going to work in more browsers and more devices and we're going to get there, but it's, it's still, it's a slow process because the technologies involved are pretty tough to figure out. Okay, well, yeah. we've covered a lot of things today. Uh, uh, we've heard a lot of acronyms, uh, but is there anything we've left out? Uh, we'll go with Bear first. Well, no, I was just going to add on when Peter says um, the the configuration and technology is hard. It, it's really a it's a nuanced answer because it's easy when you're talking about having a video connection between five people or four people or two people. Um, the normal server that somebody would use at home or in an office would be able to handle that just fine. But when you're talking about trying to do video connection between a thousand people, that's when the problems start to creep in. And that's where you have to know about TCP IP stream tuning and various, you know, operating system level tune tuning in order to make sure that you don't, ex you know, run out of uh, socket handles in your server because you forgot to set, you know, the, 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 the variable to more than 1,024. Little things like that that huh. you have to, that requires hard, hard, hard learned uh, knowledge. But the, the goal, we do have a goal of eventually exposing all of that, just like we're open sourcing everything. But right now it's too variable in order to get that get to that point. Um, what was your question about things that going forward? Oh, or? No, just uh, if, if there's anything we haven't covered in today's show that you really want to make sure our audience is aware of. Um, just, just to reemphasize that everything, what you see on Talkie is, the, is our fancy UI but everything else that's involved with Talkie.io is on otalk.org in many pieces. And all the technology is there. If, if somebody really wanted to implement Talkie themselves, they could use stanza.io, they could use Jingle, they could use um, the various libraries that are, that are including the, the, the D version that we have, which we have upstream, but we also keep a copy of it in the otalk.org uh, repo. That, that's all there and available. So somebody could go there and create instances of all these products, write some JavaScript code to glue it together and create their own Talkie.io. Nothing is preventing anybody from doing that. Um, that to us, that's a point of pride. Um, sure, there's some secret sauce on how to scale the thing so it can handle 5,000 users an hour, um, but not many people need that for their own home projects. So that's the biggest thing I wanted to reemphasize. And Peter, same question to you. Yeah, Randall, I think I wanted to just talk briefly because um, Bear mentioned the scaling stuff. And I know that one of the things that you're probably interested in is, oh, could we use this or something like this for Floss Weekly? Mm -hmm. Part of the challenge is that, like what Bear's talking about, to scale it up to having a thousand people watching at the same time, right? We would love to do build this kind of stuff out for, let's say, online learning applications where someone could give a lecture and then you could have, have breakout groups and stuff like that. We've done some work in that direction, but the broadcast stuff where we have um, a lot of people watching at the same time is, is an, another area that we're very excited about perhaps working on. Um, if we can find a customer who might want us to pay us because it's going to take quite a bit of effort. But um, I think the my point is, following on what Bear said, we, it's a slow process to try to get some of this stuff defined and mm -hmm. built out. And I know people have been hoping for years that, oh, something like Jitsi would provide this slot in replacement for Skype. There's a lot of work that's happening behind the scenes. It's not always that visible, but things like Restund D, stuff, things like the WebRTC project, uh, some of the stuff that we've done with Jabber and XMPP, we're getting there and, and we're getting to the point, I think over the next few years, well, where it will be easier for people to do this stuff that Bear's talking about, where they can build something like Talkie on their own and have more of that knowledge out there and defined and documented and have all the open source code available so that people can build these sorts of applications. We are getting there. It, it has taken us a long time, but it doesn't mean that folks haven't been slaving away on this for years on end to try to make it easier for developers to build this sort of stuff in an open source way. And then one other minor question. When we have you back on again seven years from now, what do you think you'll be working on? 
Um, I'm very <laughs> passionate about communication. That's why I got involved with Jabber back in 1999. So I think I'll still be working on communication. Now, whether we're doing holographic rooms, you know, and who knows what kind of devices we'll have uh, eight years from now. But uh, I think I'll still be passionate about and working on communication at some level, whether it's something beyond uh, audio, video even. There's so much that we have to do still to make this stuff easy to use for people. Why should I have to sit in front of this stupid computer in order to have this call? Why can't I just be, you know, wandering around in my office or something like that and you can have a much more dynamic interaction that's kind of where we want to get to so that people can really work together and interact together in a much more natural organic way cool, yeah and cool. for me for me the, the i'll be back in seven years to talk about how we managed to scale this to the galactic network <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, Bear and Peter, thank you for coming on the show and talking to us about so many acronyms that it just made my head spin. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Randall and Guillermo. Very good. And that was uh, Peter uh, St. Andre, Andre and uh, and Bear, as we know him. Uh, what did you think there, Guillermo? Uh, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, acronyms getting uh, thrown around that I need to us. Uh, I, I really need to start learning more about WebRTC. So I know how, how it works, you know, as, as a uh, base technology, but I, I really haven't played around with it too much. Now, now I'm kind of interested. I want to I want to see what we can do with that. Yeah, it sounds like fun. And uh, I play a little bit with Taki uh, over the last few weeks, but uh, I haven't had anybody really to talk to or having anybody to really have like a whole conversation with. Uh, maybe I'll set up a uh, just launch a Taki with a URL and then just paste it into my uh Google Plus feed and see who's, who joins. That might be sort of interesting, just kind of like a mm -hmm. chat with Randall time, ask me anything kind of thing. That'd be kind of fun, actually. Now, I may have to do that when I get time. Don't have time today, though. Um, and speaking of not having time today, let's talk about our upcoming guests. Next week, we have an uh, update on OpenStack. OpenStack was actually uh, announced, I think, for the first time on Floss Weekly five years ago. And we had a nice conversation at OSCON where they were making the announcement for that. And then the following week will be CoreOS. Uh, that's something that uh, we had on only about last week, last year, but they've combined it now with Docker and Kubernetes into this package called Tectonic, which makes it much easier to deploy in the cloud. That's always handy. Uh, following that, we have Harlan Sten, who is pretty much single-handedly working on the network time protocol. It's a very important protocol that all of your computers, all of your phones, everything uses to keep uh, the time uh, um, uh, aligned. But uh, it's really just one guy working on it. So uh, we'll bring him on. He finally had, he finally had time to come on the show. Uh, talking about Kubernetes again, we, uh, Kubernetes is on the following week. That's Google's, Google's cluster management software. And we also have FWKNOP, which I don't know how to pronounce without it coming out bad. So we'll just say FWKNOP. And that's basically the next generation port knocking software for single packet authorization. Gambus, which is a free object-rated basic inspired by Visual Basic. Ichingo, which is a fork of Nagios. It's a scalable and extensible monitoring system. And then Dart is going to come back on the show. Uh, that's Casper Lund, one of the leaders. And Anders Sandholm, which I think has something to do with community. Um, we've pretty much filled up Q3, so I'm about to open up Q4. You can always see who we've got and who we're trying to get at twit.tv slash floss, which is the homepage for this show. There's a link from there over to the big spreadsheet. We do have a live stream. We tape this show at 8 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays. If you go to live.twitch.tv, you can participate with us and watch us doing it. Um, and uh, by the way, if you hear some noise in the background, it's the stupid leaf blower guy who shows up every once in a while on this show. Anyway, uh, that's that's what that noise is. Um, I apologize for that. I can't make him stop, though. Uh, you can follow us on Floss Weekly on Google+, Plus and also at Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter, and Google+, Plus Randall L. Schwartz. I am going to be this Friday at the Heathrow Sofitel, that's July 31st. Uh, there's a meetup happening from six to seven that you're not invited to, but I'll be there the rest of the evening, probably hanging out in the lobby bar if I haven't fallen asleep by then. So uh, watch my Google Plus and Twitter for uh, announcements about that. Uh, I'll also be gone for two weeks on a cruise. The show is in good hands, so Aaron Newcomb is in fact taking care of that. And that's all I wanna plug. Anything you wanna plug, Guillermo? Don't worry about the uh, leaf blower guy. He's a recurring character in on the show now. I think he's very beloved by everybody here, and uh, I, I guess uh, I guess people can look for me on YouTube. I'm I'm making a lot of videos uh, uh, now, and uh, on Twitter, uh, my my handle is at g a m a r a l, and I guess that's it. Blue Floor Guy has gone away just a little bit so I can go ahead and finish up the show because we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly. 